West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Let's discuss all of this and more with Lawrence Tribe, Professor Emeritus at Harvard Law School. Professor Tribe, it's great to have you back again on the show. We've been checking in with you throughout these hearings whenever there is an inflection point of sorts. And I wanted to get your reaction to Thursday's hearing. It certainly concluded with a bang. Do you believe the committee accomplished what it needed to do? I think the committee did a spectacular job of informing both itself and the American people of a grave ongoing danger to the survival of democracy. This final hearing made even clearer than the earlier ones did. Day by day, detail by detail, how the former president of the United States engaged in a premeditated plot to seize the election regardless of the outcome. He made clear, and his acolytes, people like Roger Stone and Steve Bannon made clear, and the committee enabled the American people to hear how they made clear that they were planning and plotting that no matter what the votes were, the president, because he knew that the way votes come in, he would look like he was doing well on election evening, would proclaim himself the winner. And then when the future votes came in, the ones that had been cast on time but hadn't been counted yet, he would say it was all phony. That was the plan. It was a plan that under the federal statutes is a seditious conspiracy. Mm. And the committee made it clear that one man was at the center of it. His own personal responsibility was made very dramatically clear. And so he clearly has to be indicted whether he will be indicted first for his dangerous theft of top secret materials that he planned to use for who knows what in Mar-a-Lago or indicted first for obstruction of justice as he is continuing to hide materials or indicted first for his role in the attempted coup and in the violent insurrection that we've just seen in great detail that's not clear. But what is clear is that he must be indicted. Let me ask you about um, the subpoena here that was issued to the former president for a moment. Um, and, and we should note, you know, it's not without precedent. You had three other presidents, um, Presidents Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, excuse me, Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton. They've all been subpoenaed. In your right. opinion and from your expertise, A, what is the likelihood that Donald Trump will testify? But more specifically, what legal recourse of action or legal course of action does the committee have if he refuses to do so? Well, the committee can do two different things. It can hold him in contempt or it can go to court. Actually, there is a third and very obvious thing because those first two take time. The most obvious thing is that it can draw the natural conclusion 
from his attempt to avoid testifying. That conclusion is that he's got something to hide and we know what he has to hide. And that is that he was at the center of a plot to overturn a free and fair election. The U.S. Supreme Court has made clear that even though you cannot use someone's refusal to testify against him in a criminal trial so that when Donald Trump is tried for various crimes, his refusal to testify can't be used against him, it can and should be used to draw the logical inference that he is trying to hide his guilt. That's why he doesn't want to come. It's not because he's got bone spurs. It's not because uh, it's not because he has forgotten too much. It's because he knows that if he is not going to perjure himself, he's going to have to convict himself. He's basically going to have to admit what we now know, and that is that he plotted to stay in power no matter what. Basically, to say to the voters, I don't care what you say, I'm, I'm the boss. Uh, and the committee will draw the inference from his silence, adding all of that to the mountain of evidence that has accumulated, will draw the inference that he was at the center of a plot to overturn the election, to commit serious insurrection against the United States government. There's speculation that Trump, um, if he were to testify, he'd prefer to do it publicly. Would public testimony be beneficial to the committee or is there fear uh, that someone like Donald Trump could turn the process into a spectacle? Well, he will try. You know, if he really meant that he wanted to testify publicly, I would take him up on his challenge. I mean, you know, come on. You know, you say you want to testify publicly. He's always said that. He said he wanted to testify before Robert Mueller. But when push comes to shove, he's a coward. Yeah. So he won't do it. But I think the committee should call his bluff. And if he testifies, he's going to lie. That's all he knows how to do. And he'll lie uh, under oath and commit perjury, adding to his crimes. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I think I, I, yeah, I was going to say, I'm with you on that one. I think he's definitely uh, afraid to to appear in front of the public and, and field those questions and have to think live in the moment uh, without, as you said, perjuring himself. Um, let me ask you, Professor Tribe, uh, you know, a big part of this focus, and you brought this up as well, a big part of the hearing focused on the idea of premeditation. And the panel, um, you know, presented multiple pieces uh, of compelling evidence that showed Trump planned to refuse to cede power regardless of the election results some of it based on close confidants months in advance let me just play for you one example of this watch a few days before the election mr trump also consulted with one of his outside advisors inside activist tom fitton about the strategy for election night the select committee got this pre-prepared statement from the National Archives. As you can see, the draft statement, which was sent on October 31st, declares, we had an election today and I won. And the Fitton memo specifically indicates a plan that only the votes counted by the election day deadline, and there is no election day deadline, would matter. Explain to us the significance of this kind of evidence when it comes to building a uh, possible criminal case against the former president. Well, the criminal case will charge that the president conspired with Fitton and with uh, Bannon and with Stone and with uh, others, including his own chief of staff, to steal the election regardless of the outcome, that if he doesn't win, He's going to claim that he won. That is a crime. It's a crime from many different angles. And part of a crime is that you have the requisite mental state, that you're not just stumbling into it, you know what you're doing. In the absence of this kind of evidence, he might have been able to say, well, I really thought I won. I was delusional. It's kind of a vague version of an insanity defense. It wouldn't have been very effective anyway, but now it's completely off the table. There's no way he can say that he really thought he won. We now have testimony that he planned, regardless of the outcome, to claim that he won. We have testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson, 
that she heard him saying to Meadows that he was embarrassed about his loss. He didn't want to admit it. He was embarrassed about the nine to nothing decision of the U.S. Supreme Court turning back his last Hail Mary pass in an attempt to have the court intervene in the election. He didn't want people to learn about it. Well, that's all proof that he wasn't just inadvertently doing something. He was deliberately violating the laws of the United States, deliberately trashing the Constitution, making it clear that he's anything but repentant, that he will do it again if we give him the chance. So he certainly should be indicted, should be convicted. And quite apart from that, voters should take it into their own hands, both in the polling booth uh, and by bringing the kinds of lawsuits that voters in New Mexico did to disqualify a county commissioner from serving in office because he had been involved in the insurrection. You know, the Constitution, Article 3, uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that if you take an oath to, to uphold the Constitution and then engage in an insurrection against the Constitution and the government or give it aid and comfort, you are disqualified from ever again holding office. And voters in every state where someone who is involved in the insurrection, including the former president, tries to get on the ballot, have the option of bringing a lawsuit to keep that person off the ballot so that this is not up to Merrick Garland alone. He has an important role to right. play in deciding when and where to indict, but it's up to voters as well. It is Monday, the 17th of October of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is River City Hash Mondays, a small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. And you know, I got to tell you, Hungary's kind of peeving me at this moment, and uh, we could be moving to the Spanish paprika. They are upping production, so uh, maybe uh, it won't be as expensive. And it's only expensive because of supply, not quality, because both the Spanish and Hungarian paprikas are equal, except in cost, and that is only because of production and supply. Spain had been doing a lot less, but they're picking up the slack now since, um, hey, I don't know, Hungary is uh, doing what they do, and that's a... That's a scary thought. On the other hand, Spain is has their own issues with a resurgent Franco regime moving their way back up. Look what's happened to Italy. Mussolini's party is back in power. Who knows? Maybe they're going to resurrect old Franco. Maybe. Okay. We got that going for us, which I don't know how nice it is. I don't know. Looks like uh, Kanye is buying Parler. Yeah, he got kicked off of a lot of other platforms, Instagram, etc., etc., for being, well, a Jew hater. There's no other way to put it. Uh, yeah, and he says it's all about free speech. I have the right to free speech to tell everybody this stuff. No, you don't. You have free speech. Free speech can only be regulated or not by the government. Somebody uh, in a private business, uh, they can do whatever they want. Look at the sign. We refuse service to, you know, people not wearing shoes. Okay. And we know why they put those up. Yeah. Too many of those kinds sitting at the lunch counter. Exactly. The fountain. Remember those days? I mean, when we had lunch counters and fountains. Yeah. Anyway, uh, old Kanye thinks that uh, he has a right. And I suppose, you know, if you uh, buy your own social media platform, it's kind of like buying a newspaper. 
do what you want, apparently. That's what, uh, you know, you don't have to adhere to any journalistic integrity because now you have a voice because you have the newspaper. Spew out anything you want. Some people just keep it with newsletters rather than newspapers. But, hey, it's, uh, you know, moving on up in the world. So, uh, I don't know. It, it Parler seems to be struggling, and I wonder why, considering Candace Owens' husband is the CEO. Did you know he also used to run the uh, Turning Point USA organization, and then he moved over to Parler? Yeah, well, seems like Turning Point USA is uh, booming. Yeah, they got all sorts of uh, seminars coming up with Victor Orban and others. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, they're probably going to have Maloney, too. Come on over, gal. Teach us what we need to know. I want to remind folks once again, this is sort of an aside. But the fascists in Italy kicked out Steve Bannon for being too fascist, but also for being a major grifter. I mean, they got their own issues with organized crime over there. They don't need somebody like Steve Bannon coming in there and refusing to let anyone dip their beak. Yeah, I got to tell you, when you're too fascist for, uh, for the fascists in Italy... And you're too much of a grifter for the organized crime mobs up and down that boot. Uh, that says something. So put him in jail. For, I, I, I heard that they can put him in jail for six months. Do it. Other people will say he's never going to jail. I, who cares? Just the idea that he might. It's, it's, it's filling me with joy. It does. It fills me with joy. <laughs> Okay, well, 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 I had an issue once again. You know, I, I, I'm i going to reiterate, if you're not careful, old age can kill you. Man, every time I turn around, literally, something happens with my base, meaning my legs, and I get another flare up with this arthritis issue. It's th This particular one is actually bone on bone on the knee that I should be getting replaced. But I have to wait just for a little bit. There's too much going on right now. But uh, uh, so th there's nothing really to do about it short of, I don't know, lopping it off, making it a little bit longer with artificial materials and putting me on my way. But there's a bit of recovery involved in that, and I, I need time. Time. Isn't that a constant lament people had on their on their tombstones? You know, he was actually going to live his life as soon as he got time. And then he's dead. That's what happens. Do, do I want that on my tombstone? I was going to get a knee replacement when I got time. Okay. Well, that's the ultimate replacement now, isn't it? It is. Speaking of which, I'm going all over the place because it is River City Hash Mondays. We just throw everything that's been left over from the weekend into one lovely gourmet dish for your gourmet delight. But it's like a casserole in a way. Look at it that way. But because we're a morning show, we're making a hash. Anyway, uh, speaking of replacement. I saw a TikTok video of a woman, and I had the sound off the first couple of times I watched this because I, I, I just, I didn't. It was scary. It was a, it was a cooking uh, tutorial on how to make a chicken pot pie. I don't know in white America. Okay, so I turned up the sound, and it turned out to be, you know, not a terribly, uh, I mean, not terribly young, not terribly old. Maybe a woman in her, uh, in her upper twenties, say, or around there. It's hard to tell sometimes with people, but uh, and she had, you know, the customary tats, and her hair piled up in something like uh, dreadlocks, and. The requisite scarf tied it up as well. And she took pre-made pie, 
uh, dough and filled it up, lined the bottom with uh, sliced carrots, canned sliced carrots, chicken tenders breaded. Oh, my God. And then what else? Oh, canned peas. Put some canned peas in there. Put in canned cheddar cheese. They call it cheddar cheese, but it's, I don't know what it is. It's canned cheese. And I don't think she put in cream of mushroom or anything like that. But then she takes another pre-made pie uh, and, and plopped it over on top of it. Not not rolling out something and, you know, crimping the edges. The bottom of another pie and plopped it on that baby and cooked it off. And I got to tell you, I've been seeing this weird, uh, uh, I, there's no other way to put it. It's Nazi propaganda about Joe Biden bringing in rapists and drug dealers. And they just, they raped a three-year-old girl. And, you know, it's all just fear-mongering, making the Willie Horton ad seem like, I don't know, Sesame Street. And um, it's it, it comes right off the top. At the beginning of this ad, they're coming here to take things away to replace your culture. And when I saw what this young woman was calling a chicken pot pie, that is the culture that I wish just would someone come and replace that. Would you please? I mean, maybe we would even pay. We might. Because there's many things that are are destroying America. Uh, the designated hitter in baseball obviously is one that you all know about because I can't shut up about it. And I haven't since they put it in back in the 60s. The pitcher must bat. Otherwise, it's not baseball. And if it's not baseball, it's not America. There's some truisms that we have to adhere to. And when they're taken away, all hell breaks loose. And look where we are. And one of the other things that is destroying America is this idea of semi-homemade. I got to tell you, I don't know what is semi about that. I don't know what's homemade. But that culture needs to be replaced. Please. Please. I like my food spicy. I like women spicy. I'd like my politics to be rather boring, bland. All right. Oh, that's because uh, apparently Americans don't want any mini Trumps, but they're really bored with Joe Biden. Really? I thought that was like a good thing. And it is. Okay. Well, we do have a full show of actually much longer uh, offerings than we normally do here, especially at the top. So why don't we get right into it so that we can attend to these at the the very top, of course, uh, the January 6th committee made Trump's culpability dramatically clear, and we know what that means. On the rest of the menu, Trump attacked American Jews and warned they better send more money, or else. The Senate race in Ohio is ground zero for hopes of more manufacturing jobs. And months after the moon landing... An immigrant family from India showed up uninvited at Neil Armstrong's family home. And they never forgot how they were treated. After the break, we move to the chef's table where a far-right Sweden Democrats party official has been suspended for making degrading comments about Jewish teenage Holocaust victim Anne Frank. And UK leader Liz Truss went from triumph to trouble in six short weeks. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, who I should mention uh, streamed live the Warnock-Walker debate the other night. And that was on our Twitch channel. And also you can go to our Facebook. I know, I know, I know. But you can check it out on our Facebook channel as well. So uh, she's done some reprises. Reprise. And uh, so look forward to those, plus the new ones coming up, because we have some more debates of not only those candidates, but others in the popper. And we'll look forward to that. So thank you, Kelly. If you would look across from the chat room link there uh, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you'll notice our Patreon page. And yes, I have to tell you, we do need help paying our bills, and it's quite wonderful that there are many of you out there who uh, do so. And how do how does one do so? Well, you send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, and then we uh, pool those funds and pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue this bulwark of resistance against dark forces arrayed not only against representative democracy here in the United States of America, but representative democracy worldwide. It's happening now, and you can see it in real time. And we can choose what we do, and we are doing what we can here. And uh, look, thank you. (laughs) Thank you for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill that civic duty that the founders originally intended so many years ago. You can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I happen to post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And you can find those show notes and links to uh, each show at my uh, Daily Co's page. And you can find that through my Twitter feed. So there at Justice Putnam. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, really wherever podcasts can be found. And of course, the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library of shows over the past 11 plus years can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays, is by Rosalind S. Helderman from the Washington Post. Donald Trump attacked American Jews in a post on his Truth Social platform on Sunday yesterday, saying Jews in the United States must, quote, get their act together, end quote, and show more appreciation for the state of Israel before it's too late. American Jews have long been accused of holding secret loyalty to Israel rather than the United States, and Trump's post leaned on that anti-Semitic trope, suggesting that by virtue of their religion, American Jews should show more appreciation to Israel. Trump also complained in the post that no president had done more for Israel than he, but that Christian evangelicals are far more appreciated of this than the people of the Jewish faith, especially those in the U.S. Well, that's because the evangelicals think that when all the Jews go back to Israel, the end of the world's coming, and only they will go to heaven, and all the mud people will stay back in the mud that will be a burning, flaming rock in space. Nice, huh? It is not the first time Trump has suggested that American Jews, who traditionally have more often aligned with the Democratic Party on domestic policy, should be more supportive of him because of how he dealt with Israel. Jewish people who live in the United States don't love Israel enough. Does that make sense to you? He said in an interview last year with an Orthodox Jewish magazine, adding that it seemed strange to him that he did not have more Jewish support. Well, you're, you're a Jew hater. Come on. 
At a Hanukkah event in the White House in 2018, for example, he drew criticism for referring to Israel as your country while speaking to American Jews. He was also rebuked when he said during an Oval Office meeting in 2019 that any Jewish people who would vote for a Democrat, I think it shows either a total lack of knowledge or great disloyalty. Trump's latest diatribe about Jews came as Republican candidates have made overt appeals to racial animus and resentments in the closing weeks of the midterm election campaign. It also comes as Republican figures have failed to disavow musician and sometimes supporter, Ye, the rapper and fashion designer formerly known as Kanye West. Ye, earlier this month, tweeted that he wanted to go on DEFCON 3 on Jewish people, an apparent reference to DEFCON, the U.S. military defense readiness system. Instagram and Twitter removed posts by the artists who had been featured on conservative Fox News host Tucker Carlson's show. And Trump has long been frustrated that he has not drawn more support from American Jews, particularly when, as president, he moved the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and his Jewish son-in-law, Jared Kushner, helped negotiate new treaties between Israel and some of its Arab neighbors. On her personal Twitter account, Nira Tandon, a senior advisor to President Biden, wrote, We should all stand against what feels like a growing chorus of anti-Semitism. There should be no quarter for it in our politics or culture. David J. Lynch, also of the Washington Post, brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The transformation of American manufacturing that is unfolding here in Ohio promises to reshape the nation's economy and its politics with new solar energy, electric vehicle, and semiconductor plants sprouting in faded factory towns. Talk of industrial revival already is starring in the race for Ohio's open U.S. Senate seat as both Representative Tim Ryan and Republican J.D. Vance to seek to embed themselves in the state's comeback narrative. In interviews, Ryan embraced the Biden administration's use of generous government subsidies to encourage creation of new manufacturing jobs, while Vance touted Trump's import tariffs and said faster development of the state's energy resources could spark a boom. What's playing out on the ground, though, is different from what the candidates stress on the stump. Manufacturing jobs are growing in Ohio, but they are not the jobs that disappeared decades ago. Manufacturing has changed so much in recent years that the blue-collar job gains from new factories, while welcome, are likely to pale alongside the 5 million U.S. jobs lost since the late 90s. Many of the new positions will require special skills or education that most blue-collar workers lack. Much of the work will be done by machines. The White House says manufacturing is booming thanks to federal investments and the industry's rethinking of supply chain risks amid the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Biden has won passage of three bills designed to promote domestic manufacturing, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, and the Chips and Science Act, which subsidizes semiconductor production.
Teresa Vargas of the Washington Post brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. The extraordinary story spilled out in the most ordinary of ways at a dinner party. Joe Chim and Anisha Abraham were both living in Hong Kong at the time, and during a get-together one night, Chim listened as Abraham talked about the day her family met Neil Armstrong's family. She listened as Abraham described how the encounter occurred months after the astronaut walked on the moon, an event that brought people together, even as other issues pulled them apart. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated only a year earlier. She listened as Abraham described how she was a baby when her parents and grandmother, who had migrated from India to the United States, went on a road trip and found themselves passing a sign that announced the small town of Wapakoneta, Ohio, as the home of Neil Armstrong. She listened as Abraham described the stares and whispers her mother, Nirmala Abraham, and grandmother, Elizabeth George, drew as they walked through the town in their flowing saris, and how her father grew nervous when her grandmother suggested they knock on the door of Armstrong's parents' home to pay their respect. The family didn't know if anyone would be home, and if they were, how they might react to immigrants standing on their doorstep. Elsewhere in the country, white people had set dogs on black and brown people who showed up uninvited on their property. Abraham's grandmother decided to knock anyway. What happened next is the subject of a short film Chim wrote and directed called One Small Visit. The actress had not written a screenplay before hearing that story, but it stayed with her. And in 2020, she started working on a draft. The story was just too wonderful to keep within one family, Chim told me on a recent morning. I thought we should share it. The film recently won the Best Foreign Picture at the L.A. Shorts Film Festival and has been viewed at screenings across the world, including at NASA's D.C. headquarters. It will also be shown at the Kennedy Center to high school students at the D.C. South Asian Film Festival and at the newly reopened National Air and Space Museum. Now, the reporter has watched it and not a movie critic, and this is not a review, and they don't trust film scrutinizing skills enough to offer any of us that, but she can tell you how a small family story grew into a big screen production and why 53 years after that nervous knock came another one, this time on a D.C. door. It's not incidental that a story about a South Asian family's experience comes at a time of increased anti-Asian hate crimes. As a Chinese-Canadian woman who has lived in multiple countries, Chim found herself troubled by the global divides that she was seeing during the pandemic. With the film, she saw an opportunity to address issues of race, identity, and belonging. The screening, she said, have taken on the feel, feel of symposiums with audience members sharing their own experience. Chim has described the film in this way. Ultimately, it's a story between two very different families finding connection and a shared humanity, a testament to taking leaps of faith as small acts of openness and kindness that make a difference. Well, that is one movie documentary that I would like to see. And you can read the rest of the article at the show notes and links diary that I have posted. So do. And now let us go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, from ear to ear and all the way to the bank, 
The horror pick drawing them into the cinema right now is called Smile. It's an extension of director Parker Finn's 2020 short, Laura Hasn't Slept, a redux of which we get during the first substantive scene of the full length. Our hero is Dr. Rose Carter, a confident young therapist working at a psychiatric facility. Things take a turn when a graduate student shows up there, claiming that an entity that no one else can see is pursuing her, and who, during a psychotic episode, commits gory suicide in front of Rose with a shard from a broken vase, of course with a sick, eerie smile on her face. In classic genre style, we soon find out that the victim is on to something as Rose's life starts going sideways after witnessing this incident, which we learn parallels an event from her own life, generating a side plot that figures prominently at the conclusion. Not unlike other recent horror picks, think It Follows, The Grudge, or The Ring, we're dealing with a subtle and contagious demon coming from trauma. Only late in this one do we see its corporeal representation. Finn gives us jump tricks, which are enhanced by close-up shooting, often at weird angles where intimate space can be violated in a flash. Another technique used is having the shot sequences venture down an alternative and usually psychotic storyline before we're snapped back to reality. Kevin Bacon's daughter Sosie brings off Rose from put-together professional to desperate spiraling loon with strong support from Cal Penn and Jesse Usher. Like the old song said, smiling faces show no traces of that evil that lurks within. If a fan of smart horror, check out Smile. Heart patients, though, check with your physician first. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As fall turns to winter, the flu season will be upon us in force. The best way to avoid influenza is to get immunized. Everyone six months and older should be vaccinated. Those at increased risk for flu complications include children under the age of five and adults 65 and older, people with chronic health problems such as heart disease, asthma, and diabetes, and pregnant women. To get your annual flu vaccine, see your health care provider or go to a pharmacy, grocery store, or clinic in your area. If you get influenza, talk with your health care provider right away about antiviral medication. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good eating habits developed in childhood can last a lifetime, but getting children to eat their fruits and vegetables is a common problem. Eating them adds important nutrients, helps control weight, and reduces the risks for many serious illnesses. Children in the U.S. are eating more fruit. However, 60% of children get fewer fruits than recommended, and 93% don't get enough vegetables. Child care schools and school districts can help change this by meeting or exceeding federal nutrition standards for meals and snacks, including fruits and vegetables wherever food is offered, and helping children learn about and taste fruits and vegetables. At home, parents can eat a variety of fruits and vegetables with their children and provide them as snacks, even if it takes many tries. Also, parents can include their children when shopping for, growing, and preparing fruits and vegetables. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This is the story of a very special woman. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician or an entrepreneur. Her knowledge was limitless and still is. She could also make monsters disappear, especially those that lurked in the shadows under the bed. Once, this woman put back together a teenage girl's broken heart, which had been shattered in a thousand pieces just by giving her a bear hug. She masqueraded as a regular person at work, but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her mom. Your hero needs you now.
and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources, at aarp.org caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Tom Hartman, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Make sure you're registered to vote. Go to rockthevote.org. Vote for Democrats up and down the ticket. This message, a public service from all the fine people of netrootsradio.com. What is question four? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Last July, the Massachusetts legislature overwhelmingly voted for the Work and Family Mobility Act a law that allows qualified Massachusetts residents to apply for a driver's license regardless of their immigration status. Before driving, the law requires the licensed applicant to be trained, tested, licensed, and insured. The law will allow immigrants without status to make essential trips to work to get their kids to school, to medical appointments, and to the grocery store. Similar laws already exist in 17, 17 other states, many of which have experienced measurable improvements in road safety. After all, in case of an accident, it's important that all parties have insurance and proper identification. One reason this law, this public safety measure, is supported by a majority of district attorneys and sheriffs and major city police chiefs. But after the law passed, an opposition group gathered enough signatures to put the issue on the ballot this November. The question, the fourth question on the ballot is, should the law be retained? Please don't be confused by the wording of question four. Voting yes will keep the law in place. And remember to turn the ballot to the back. That's where question four is printed. That's where you can vote in favor of both human rights and public safety by voting yes on question four. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1877. That was the day that John D. Rockefeller and his company Standard Oil struck a deal with the Pennsylvania Railroad that would cement his monopoly on the nation's oil refineries. In the early 1870s, Rockefeller was building his oil empire out from its center in Cleveland, Ohio. In October of 1877, the nation went through a great upheaval, a popular uprising of a quarter of a million railroad workers and their allies. The uprising had only ended after a series of bloody skirmishes in rail centers across the country that saw 100 workers killed. The Pennsylvania Railroad had lost $3 million in destroyed property. Recognizing the railroad was in trouble, Rockefeller decided to capitalize on the opportunity. The railroad had just entered into a partnership with one of Rockefeller's competitors, the Empire Transport Company, earlier that year. The strike had weakened both partners. Rockefeller was able to purchase Empire's assets far below their actual value. For example, he purchased an Empire oil refinery in Pennsylvania for a half a million dollars. Within four years, that refinery had earned Rockefeller three times that amount. But the most important part of the deal was that Rockefeller could ship his oil on the Pennsylvania Railroad so cheaply that he could drive out his remaining competition. Standard oil was shipped on rail for eight cents a barrel. Other companies had to pay more than $1.44. By the 1890s, Rockefeller's refineries handled 90% of the nation's oil. His ruthless efforts to drive out competition made Rockefeller increasingly unpopular with the public and the target of anti-monopoly reformers. In addition, Rockefeller and his company became increasingly notorious for their heavy-handed anti-labor practices, most infamously for the Ludlow Massacre of 1914. Mm-hmm. 
thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. We always begin, whether from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 51 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs of only around 80. We're in a cooling trend. Looks like we'll be sunny throughout the day, winds light and variable. A few clouds overnight with lows in the upper 40s, low 50s, winds light and variable. And then some clouds in the morning will give way to mainly sunny skies for the afternoon tomorrow. Highs around 83, winds light and variable. And it looks like we might have a sizable uh, rainstorm coming in at the end of the week lasting through the weekend into next week. So let's only hope that that's true. Ragweed pollen is rated low right outside the window here in Rogue River. The air quality index for the Rogue River Valley region is good at 29 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is in the fall moderate range and has ticked down one level to level three. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.12 inches. Visibility is at 8 miles. And relative humidity is at 100%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 66 and fair. Paris is 64 degrees with a heavy rain shower and an advisory for potential flooding. Rome is 80 degrees and fair. Kiev is 58 and fair. Kabul is 58 and clear. Hong Kong is 80 degrees with fair and lots of wind. Tokyo is 68 with rain. Sydney, Australia is 60 degrees and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 55 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 64 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. at the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. A Sweden Democrats official was suspended by the far-right party for making degrading comments about Jewish teenage diarist Anne Frank. In an Instagram posting that has now been deleted, Rebecca Follenqvist called and Frank immoral, among other things, according to Swedish media. Anne, who wrote a diary while hiding in Amsterdam before she was captured, died at age 15 in Nazi Germany's Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in February of 1945. The posting by Fallenkvist, a 26-year-old head of television programming for the Sweden Democrats, prompted strong reactions from Jewish groups and Israeli Ambassador Kuhlman, who said, I strongly condemn this despicable insult, disrespectful of the memory of Anne Frank. His posting, including what appeared to be a screenshot of Fallenkvist's Instagram post, the Sweden Democrats media director, uh, Oscar Cavalli Bjorkman, told the Swedish news agency TT late on Saturday that the party would take Fallen Givist insensitive and inappropriate comments seriously and launched an internal investigation on the matter. 
While it remained unclear what kind of point she was trying to make with her comments on Anne's diary, she sent later a text message to Swedish newspaper Dagens Nieder saying she had been misinterpreted. The book is a moving depiction of human good and evil, Fallenquist said in her message to the newspaper. The good Anne, who in the first chapters is like any other young girl, living her life in peace and finding interest in boys, which I highlighted, is contrasted with the evil of Nazism. My story was aimed at good and human in Anne while not playing down the evil to which she was subjected. Sweden Democrats was founded in the 1980s by people who had been active in right-wing extremist groups, including neo-Nazis. The party emerged as Sweden's second-largest party in the September election under the leadership of Jimmy Ackeson. And on Friday, three Swedish center-right parties agreed to form a coalition government with the support of the Sweden Democrats that has moved toward mainstream politics, but remains hardline on immigration. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. Jill Lawless of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. When Liz Truss was running to lead Britain this summer, an ally predicted her first weeks in office would be turbulent, but few were prepared for the scale of the sound and fury, least of all Truss herself. In just six weeks, the Prime Minister's libertarian economic policies have triggered a financial crisis, emergency central bank intervention, multiple U-turns, and the firing of her Treasury chief. Now, Trust faces a mutiny inside the governing Conservative Party that leads her leadership hanging by a thread. Conservative lawmaker Robert Halfen fumed that the last few weeks had brought one horror story after another. It's not as if the party wasn't warned. During the summertime contest to lead the Conservatives, Trust called herself a disruptor who would challenge economic orthodoxy. She promised she would cut taxes and slash red tape and would spur Britain's sluggish economy to grow. Her rival, former Treasury Chief Rishi Sunak, argued that immediate tax cuts would be reckless amid the economic shockwaves from the coronavirus pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Truss was doing what she and allies said she would. Libertarian think tank chief Mark Littlewood predicted during the summer there would be fireworks as the new prime minister pushed for economic reform at absolutely breakneck speed. Still, the scale of the announcement took financial markets and political experts by surprise. The pound plunged to a record low against the U.S. dollar, and the cost of government borrowing soared. The Bank of England was forced to step in to buy government bonds and prevent the financial crisis from spreading to the wider economy. The central bank also warned that interest rates will have to rise even faster than expected to curb inflation that is running around 10% leaving millions of homeowners facing big increases in mortgage payments. I guess if you're going to F around, then you're going to find out. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for... 
Terry Tonchato Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver